Now we're joined by our guest. He's the voice of the Giants. We I always get to see him every day in the office, but I haven't seen Bob face to face till I set up the codec in his office to do a serious show about three months ago. And that's Bob Papa. How are you, Bob? I'm doing great, John. Yeah, it's it stinks not being at the facility and uh, seeing everybody and getting a feel for the new players that are there and new coaching staff and seeing you and our, our little back of the cafeteria, big table that our group sits at. You know, who knows when we're going to actually be sitting at that table again, even when we get back in the facility, because I think we're facing a lot of changes that uh, – we're going to have to deal with moving forward. Yeah, in fact, uh, our, our buddy Mike Beckton in our production department worked with Ronnie Barnes and uh, a bunch of other people at the facility. They put together a really good video for the folks out there that kind of want to see what it's going to be like when we all get back to work. Uh, go check it out on Giants.com. It's uh, definitely worth a watch. Uh, Bob and I aren't back yet. Only some staff went back um, to, to kind of get things started, Bob. And I guess we can start there. What's your feeling here? I mean, you're involved in league circles. You hear stuff. You do your national show on Sirius. Do you think in a full training camp, four preseason games, are they going to try to limit that? What's your feel for what the the summer is going to look like when these players finally return? Um, I think that they don't know. I think they have several plans probably laid out as a league as far as how each state is doing and how they can do this as equally as possible so that there's – not an advantage for one team over another. The thing I found a little confusing was earlier in the week, the league announced that um, <clears throat> there would be no joint practices this summer and that teams that go away for training camp, Cowboys in Oxnard, the Steelers always go to Latrobe, and some of these other teams will use a college campus, that they're not allowed to do that either. So I understand all of that. But then I'm trying to wrap my brain around, well, then how are you going to have four preseason games? Because if you're going to keep the teams away from each other and you don't want dual practicing, you still have to bring two teams and two staffs and two organizations together to play preseason games. And we're not talking about regular season roster numbers. We're talking about 90. So that's 180. That's 35 more a team that you're going to have. And, and so I don't know. Um, what the future holds as far as the preseason is concerned. But based on the fact they don't want teams practicing together and they don't want teams traveling to remote locations, it would seem logical to me that you would say, hey, you know, maybe we're going to just have two preseason games and we're going to do it where teams are geographically close to each other and you guys just go play each other. If you have to bus in the day of, great. Yeah, absolutely, and it could be one of those deals where the league can you know, see what it looks like. They've talked about perhaps removing some preseason games before. Maybe this could be a window into how something like that would work in the future if you do want to reduce from four preseason games when they do um, increase the regular season. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's coming down the pike anyway. Um, the other thing is, right, I mean, we don't know what it's going to look like when the regular season gets here as far as – fans in the building or no fans in the building or a limited amount of fans in the building. So is it worth opening up the buildings for preseason games, multiple preseason games? Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a question that they have to answer from a business model standpoint, but more importantly, from a player safety, staff safety, health standpoint. And I, and again, the NFL has a little time on its side because you know, we're still in the early stages of June, and the first preseason game isn't until the second week of August. Things could change. Who knows what they'll decide moving forward. Yeah, who knows? Well, let's talk about the Giants offseason because we're at the point now here, Bob, and who knows, you might still have another addition. Maybe Marcus Golden comes back at some point. But you have a pretty good idea of what Dave Gettleman's vision was uh, for this offseason and how he executed it with both free agency and and the draft your overall thoughts now that you've taken a holistic view as to what's happened over the past couple of months well I mean I think it's fitting in the terms of what Joe Judge the head coach is looking for and and I don't think Gettleman is uh that far off the philosophy anyway of looking nope. for players that have versatility I mean you know, Gettleman did a great job as the director of pro personnel for the Giants as the Giants put together you know, three teams that went to a Super Bowl. They lost in 2000, but 
there were a lot of good veteran players that they had signed under Ernie Accorsi. And then, you know, the free agent job that Ernie did to build the foundation for the 07 team and then the 2011 team. And there was a player versatility. There were people that could do a lot of different things and, and not be pigeonholed. And, you know, uh, Joe Judge comes from the Saban Belichick school and there's an element of Parcells and Coughlin is part of that whole thing where they try to find what players do best and then ask them to do that really well. And I think a lot of times coaches uh, get caught up in um, what guys can't do. It was interesting. I was watching on NFL Network. I had recorded it. Um, one of the football lives. And one of them was uh, the 95 Cleveland Browns. And it talked about Belichick and his staff and and uh, all the great people that were on his staff that have had huge success in the NFL as, as general managers and front office people and yep. coaches like Saban. And in one of the early episodes when he first got to Cleveland, he was sitting there with Mike Lombardi and he asked for a scouting report on a player. And Belichick just sort of smirked and he said, yep, that's the typical scouting report. You know, uh, you know, uh, you're telling me all the things that he can't do. He can't run. He can't do this. He can't do that. We're great coaches, but these guys can't do the job. And Belichick's like, we got to get rid of that philosophy. We got to find out what they do well. And then we as coaches have to try to implement that into what we're doing so we get the best out of each individual. And I think that's what Joe Judge wants to do, and I think that's, those are the kind of players that the Giants have brought in. Yeah, I agree. And when you look at the way they've built this offense down, just based on what you know about Jason Garrett, what you know about how you think Joe Judge will want to try to win football games, do you sense a, a very run-heavy attack here, Bob? Of course, look, we all know the final percentages get dictated by you know game flow and score and things like that. But when these games start, before you get into who scores and everything like that, do you think this is going to be uh, designed as a very run-heavy play action operation is it going to be a little bit more wide open with a lot of short passes H how do you think this offense is going to look when we finally see it on the field in august and september well i don't think it's any great secret right because they said that they're going to run a lot of stuff that jason garrett's familiar with and that he ran in dallas whether he was the offensive coordinator or um as the head coach and i think it will center around the run Hey, remember the Patriots, um, when they won the Super Bowl two years ago, if you look at what they did in the second half of the season and in winning the Super Bowl, they were a run-heavy team yep. with multiple backs. And I think the Giants are going to try to do the same thing. Um, the Giants need Saquon Barkley to stay healthy, and they need him to be reminiscent of his rookie season. Uh, he put numbers up last year, but uh, we know that it was he wasn't the same player with the high ankle sprain injury. They need him to be the guy that he was as a rookie, and obviously we talk about this every year, but if Evan Ingram remains healthy, and when Evan Ingram is healthy, he's the X factor, and this offense looks a lot more fluid. It just opens things up for people. And when he's not on the field, um, the offense can get a little bit bogged down because they don't have that DeAndre Hopkins or Julio Jones type guy at wide receiver they have good wide receivers, but you got to factor Ingram into the mix and Barkley catching passes out of the backfield. Remember, he had 91 catches his rookie season. When you have those guys healthy and performing, there's a lot of different ways you can attack a defense. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't, I don't really see, Bob, the concern with the receiving core per se. They have guys that can get open. Look, Golden Tate can create separation. Sterling Shepard can create separation. We'll see about his health issues with the concussions last year. Darius Slayton had a very promising rookie year. Barkley and Ingram are both mismatched players. So while they might not have that number one all-pro level wide receiver, these guys are going to get open. There are going to be guys to throw the ball to that are open down the field. Well, the Patriots have won a couple Super Bowls without those guys. Right. You know, without the – you know, they didn't win a Super Bowl when they had Randy Moss. I mean, they went undefeated in the regular season and almost did. Um, but they've won the Super Bowl. If you look at the early incarnations of uh, the Patriots in the the first – when they won three out of their first four, uh, can you name the receivers? Yeah, I mean, Troy Deion Brown. Br yeah, Deion Branch was a good player and, and Givens and, and Rache Caldwell. I mean, they had a lot of different guys, but they were guys. David Patton. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it. 
Um, and I think being balanced and being more versatile and spreading it around is something that, you know, is, is, is something they could do. But again, it goes back to Ingram being healthy because he's a mismatched nightmare and, and, and Barkley being healthy because he is a guy that you're not just throwing uh, passes in the flat to Barkley. I mean, you're, we've seen him lined up. We've seen him run routes. We've seen them create ways where in his rookie year he was isolated on somebody and he then becomes a receiver yeah. uh, similar to Christian McCaffrey. So uh, those two guys' health will go a long way in what this team does. Yeah, no question about it. Um, and then in terms of the offensive line, I think there's a lot of expectation the line gets better this year. They have a new coach in Mark Colombo, which everyone speaks very highly of. But if you look at the personnel, Bob, I mean, the center we don't know yet. The left tackle, the right guard, the left guard are all the same. And then at right tackle, Andrew Thomas, obviously you expect him to play well as such a high first-round pick, a top-five pick. But... I mean, Mike Remmers actually played fairly well at right tackle last year. So what are your expectations here for what type of improvement we'll see from an offensive line, which, as you know, can take time to build chemistry in an offseason where they haven't been together at all yet? Well, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I, I, it's a problem that a lot of teams are going to face. Um, <clears throat> how they come together as quickly as they can come together, I mean – Long gone are the days when an offensive line was given three years to gel because that's what it used to be. I mean, guys would talk about, you know, we're in our third year together, we're gelled. Now it's like, hey, we got a lot of reps during training camp. Um, let's get, let's give it a roll. So, um, look, they're, they're going to have to adjust. I think Colombo being there as the coach is really good, and I think that that's something that uh, is going to help this football team, and I think they've upgraded the offensive line coaching and I think that will make this offensive line better. All right, the quarterback, obviously the most important player on the field, Bob. And I think, you know, Daniel Jones is getting put into a real rough spot this year. Um, we know he's smart enough and diligent enough and hardworking enough to learn the new system, learn the language. I don't think that's going to be a problem. But you really can't, you know, quote-unquote, learn a system unless you actually get to execute it on the field and practice in it. And he hasn't had a chance to do that. Um, it is a very different system than the West Coast system that Pat Shermer had. Joe Judges said this. Uh, their first four games of the year against top 11 pass defenses from last year, the Niners, the Steelers, uh, the Rams, the 49ers. So uh, I think he can do it. But I think it's going to be a real challenge for Jones to try to figure this stuff out on the run in a short amount of time against some really good teams early in the regular season. Yeah, I mean, look, the the Giants, uh, I think of the Browns with Kevin Stefanski as the new head coach. I think of, you know, Carolina with Matt Rule. Hey, these guys are – this is tough with Joe Judge, right? I mean, you're coming in here. You haven't been in front of your team. You're going to be in front of your team in a short basis. But – you know, if they can play smart, disciplined football, not commit penalties, um, and follow the plan, you know, they're going to have an opportunity to win football games, John. I mean, I, you, I, I look at the schedule uh, sometimes maybe not as critically as other people look at it because, um, you know, I always think back to the year that Peyton Manning missed the whole season. Yeah. And everybody spent their off season fretting of, you know, oh man, in week five we gotta go to Indy and play the Colts and that's gonna be a nightmare. And then he wound up missing the whole season, he got hurt. If you were playing the Steelers last year and you were thinking about facing Roethlisberger and suddenly it's Mason Rudolph, you know, everything changes. So I think you just take it as it comes. Things change, teams change, teams evolve, and hopefully you're getting better and you deal with the circumstances that are in front of you at that point in time. Yeah, no question. And the Giants are, on the, as you mentioned, not the only team doing it. How do you think Jones will fit in what Jason Garrett wants to do offensively? We've seen Garrett's offense with the Cowboys for years. How do you think Jones will fit into that scheme? I think it'll be fine. Uh, remember, Tony Romo wasn't just, especially the younger version of Tony Romo, wasn't a guy that just sat in the pocket like a sitting duck. They used his legs. Um, he created plays with his legs. They used his athleticism. Romo was an excellent athlete. And then we saw what they did with Dak Prescott. Remember, Dak Prescott, when he started starting, um, he was the third-string quarterback until injuries happened, and they got him ready to play, and all he did was lead the team to the playoffs. So I think with Daniel Jones' athleticism, uh, what he can do with his legs, 
Um, I think that Jason Garrett will be able to be very creative with what they do offensively with the quarterback. Yeah, and I think the big question, Bob, I'm going to flip to the other side of the ball now, still has to be on defense, right? Uh, you got to ends of games the last couple of years, big third down, you know, last drive of the game. The defense very rarely was able to come up with a stop when they needed one, and, and that's really been the core of the issues. And, and the pass defense has really been at the center of that. Where do you see the pass defense right now? And you can look at this as a combination of the pass rush with the guys and, and the real young group of guys they have back there in the defensive backfield. Well, it's, a, it's, the, it's the number one question um, about this football team, how they're going to get after the quarterback. They don't have, you know, an established stud pass rusher that you've got a game plan for. But I think being multiple, being versatile, I mean, did anyone think that Kyle Van Noy was a great pass rusher? No, but the Patriots made him into one. Um, I think you could do it by scheme. I think you could do it by assignment football. I think that, you know, you look at some of the players they have in the secondary and what they could bring to the table, and they've upgraded their linebacking core, and then they've got some of these young guys up front. I think you find I think you can find creative ways to do it. Now, what Patrick Graham has in store, that remains to be seen. And is it is it ideally what you're looking for? No. Maybe if Golden winds up coming back, He's a little bit of the X factor that, you know, helps him get some pressure on the quarterback a little bit more consistently. But it's the it's I'm not going to sit here and say all is well, because that would be a lie. Um, and I think even the Giants themselves are curious to see who emerges, who steps up. But, you know, I, I think you give them the benefit of the doubt and see how it goes. But uh you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's not a question mark because I think that's a that's a fair and honest opinion of it. Yeah, and then when you want to blitz, obviously, Bob, if you want to try to scheme up some pressure, you got to rely on your guys in the back end to cover, and we expect Patrick Graham to use a lot of man-to-man -man defense. I think everyone feels pretty good about what James Bradbury can do based on what he's done in his career. But you look at the other cornerback spot and you look at that nickel slot corner spot, and how do you think those two positions will shape up here? with a lot of the questions marks with DeAndre Baker and then, of course, a lot of the other young guys that are going to be competing for those positions? Well, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, they drafted a guy that's a slot guy. Um, I, I just want to see how they're going to use uh, Julian Love because it was weird last year how he couldn't get on the field, and then when he did, he looked like a really good player. Um, and I think that's one of the great head scratchers from last year. I think he's a player that could really – you know, help this football team in a lot of different ways in the secondary. And I thought Pepper started to feel more comfortable being back home last year as uh, before he got hurt. So I think he's going to be a nice addition with this football team as well, coming back and being healthy. How do you think they can utilize their strength on defense, which is that interior defensive line? I mean, they have a slew of guys, Bob, that are really good football players. Leonard Williams, Dexter Lawrence, Dalvin Tomlinson. These guys can all play. Yeah. I mean, uh, they they got a lot of and listen they invested some um uh they invested you know draft capital in these guys over the last couple of years and then the other question is you know Leonard Williams um you know the giants decided that they wanted to trade for him this guy did go to a pro bowl um maybe in this scheme with this defensive coordinator we can see Leonard Williams back to being a little bit more of the disruptive player he was earlier in his career um, but they, they certainly have the numbers up front. And again, I think some of this has to do with coaching, has to do with planning, has to do with scheming and being organized. And I think last year, the last two years, there was a lot of uncertainty because I'm not sure if they were coordinated, so to speak, or organized as well as they could have been. Yeah, and of course, adjusting your defense week to week based on opponent, which is something else that has been a, a huge stress of you know, point for Joe Judge on offense, not on defense. All right, Bob, final question. Big picture here. When you look at this season, uh, I'm not going to give you the cliche, what's the key for the Giants to be successful, but what, how do you view a successful season this year for the Giants and Joe Judge's first year? Uh, I think a successful season is a team that, as we get to the last two games of the regular season, is in the hunt for one of the playoff spots. Um, now, I don't know if they're going to get in. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. Um, remember, they've added an extra team in each conference. Um, I think this team, to me, a successful season is 
Daniel Jones continuing his growth from what we saw last year and with one or two games to go in the 2020 NFL season that the New York Giants are alive and well. Yeah, meaningful games in December. I'm with you, Bob. So how are you keeping yourself busy these days? What do you got going on? Well, doing the show on Sirius. Uh, I'm going to be doing a Golf Channel event, uh, a PGA Tour event, coming up uh, at the end of June in Cromwell, Connecticut, the Travelers Championship. So I'm looking forward to that. But uh, we launch, you know, with so many people losing their jobs, uh, unfortunately there's a lot of families that can't afford to feed their families. So Billy Ray Brown and I of Golf Channel uh, started a cooking show, which we launched uh, last night on Instagram Live. And uh, we're just trying to raise money to help food banks in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area in the Houston area, which have been hit really hard. So if anybody wants to contribute, uh, we're going to do a show a week on Instagram Live. Just follow me at Bob Papa on Instagram. And they can go to our GoFundMe page at GoFundMe.com backslash F backslash Cooking Because. It's called Cooking Because, and we've gotten off to a pretty good start. No question. And, guys, Bob's a heck of a, a cook. Trust me. I, I hear him talk about how he crafts his meals. It's, it's, it's serious business in the Bob Papa household. No joke. Yeah, it's not. It's not a joke. I take it seriously, but we have a lot of fun and a few cocktails, so it's great. Oh, I can't beat the cocktails. Bob, good stuff, my friend. Stay safe. Good talk with you. Hopefully, we'll see you sooner than later, and uh, let's try to do this again before the season starts. You got it, my man. Thanks. Bob Papa, our guest on the Giants Little Podcast. We'll see you next time, everybody. You can find us on the Giants app on the Giants.com website. Go to Giants.com slash podcast and your favorite podcast platforms. For Bob Papa, I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you next time, everybody. Stay safe.